Second part of chapter 9 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Consciousness expresses vital equilibrium and docility. We saw in the beginning that the exigences of bodily life gave consciousness its first articulation. A bodily feat, like nutrition or reproduction, is celebrated by a festival in the mind, and consciousness is a sort of ritual solemnizing by prayer, jubilation or mourning, the chief episodes in the body's fortunes. The organs, by their structure, select the impressions possible to them from the diverse influences abroad in the world, all of which, if animal organisms had learned to feed upon them, might plausibly have offered a basis for sensation. Every instinct or habitual impulse further selects from the passing bodily affections those that are pertinent to its own operation and which consequently adhere to it and modify its reactive machinery prevalent and notable sensations are therefore signs presumably marking the presence of objects important for the body's welfare or for the execution of its predestined offices so that not only are the soul's aims transcripts of the body's tendencies but all ideas are grafted upon the interplay of these tendencies with environing forces early images hover about primary wants as highest conceptions do about ultimate achievements side note its worthlessness as a cause and value as an expression thought is essentially practical in the sense that but for thought no motion would be an action no change a progress but thought is in no way instrumental or servile it is an experience realized not a force to be used that same spontaneity in nature which has suggested a good must be trusted to fulfil it if we look fairly at the actual resources of our minds, we perceive that we are as little informed concerning the means and processes of action as concerning the reason why our motives move us. To execute the simplest intention we must rely on fate. Our own acts are mysteries to us. Do I know how I open my eyes or how I walk downstairs? Is it the supervising wisdom of consciousness that guides me in these acts? Is it the mind that controls the bewildered body and points out the way to physical habits uncertain of their affinities? Or is it not much rather automatic inward machinery that executes the marvellous work while the mind catches here and there some glimpse of the operation now with light and adhesion now with impotent rebellion when impulses work themselves out unimpeded we say we act when they are thwarted we say we are acted upon but in neither case do we in the least understand the natural history of what is occurring. The mind at best vaguely forecasts the result of action. A schematic verbal sense of the end to be accomplished possibly hovers in consciousness while the act is being performed. But this premonition is itself the sense of a process already present and betrays the tendency at work it can obviously give no aid or direction to the unknown mechanical process that produced it and that must realize its own prophecy if that prophecy is to be realized at all that such an unknown mechanism exists and is adequate to explain every so-called decision is indeed a hypothesis far outrunning detailed verification 
although conceived by legitimate analogy with whatever is known about natural processes. But that the mind is not the source of itself or its own transformations is a matter of present experience. For the world is an unaccountable datum in its existence, in its laws, and in its incidents. The highest hopes of science and morality look only to discovering those laws and bringing one set of incidents, facts of perception, into harmony with another set, facts of preference. This hoped-for issue, if it comes, must come about in the mind, but the mind cannot be its cause since, by hypothesis, it does not possess the ideas it seeks nor has power to realize the harmonies it desiderates. These have to be waited for and begged of destiny. Human will, not controlling its basis, cannot possibly control its effects. Its existence and its efforts have at best the value of a good omen. They show in what direction natural forces of moving in so far as they are embodied in given men. Side note. Thoughts march automatic and thereby implicated in events. Men, like all things else in the world, are products and vehicles of natural energy and their operation counts. But their conscious will, in its moral assertiveness, is merely a sign of that energy and of that will's eventual fortunes. Dramatic terror and dramatic humor both depend on contrasting the natural pregnancy of a passion with its conscious intent. Everything in human life is ominous, even the voluntary acts. We cannot by taking thought, add a cubit to our stature. But we may build up a world without meaning it. Man is as full of potentiality as he is of impotence. A will that represents many active forces and is skilful in divination and augury may long boast to be almighty without being contradicted by the event. Side note, contemplative essence of action. That thought is not self-directive appears best in the most immaterial processes. In strife against external forces, men, being ignorant of their deeper selves, attribute the obvious effects of their action to their chance ideas. But when the process is wholly internal, the real factors are more evenly represented in consciousness and the magical involuntary nature of life is better perceived. My hand, guided by I know not what machinery, is at this moment adding syllable to syllable upon this paper to the general fulfillment, perhaps, of my felt intent, yet giving that intent an articulation wholly unforeseen and often disappointing. The thoughts to be expressed simmer half-consciously in my brain. I feel their burden and tendency without seeing their form, until the mechanical train of impulse association started by the perusal of what precedes or by the accidental emergence of some new idea lights the fuse and precipitates the phrases. If this happens in the most reflective and deliberate of activities like this of composition, how much more does it happen in positive action? The die is cast, said Caesar, feeling a decision in himself of which he could neither count nor weigh the multitudinous causes, and so says every strong and clear intellect, every well-formed character, seizing at the same moment with comprehensive instinct both its purposes and the means by which they shall be attained. Only the fool, 
whose will signifies nothing, boasts to have created it himself. We must not seek the function of thought, then, in any supposed power to discover either ends not suggested by natural impulse or means to the accomplishment of those irrational ends. Attention is utterly powerless to change or create its objects in either respect. It rather registers without surprise, for it expects nothing in particular, and watches eagerly the images bubbling up in the living mind and the processes evolving there. These processes are themselves full of potency and promise. Will and reflection are no more inconsequential than any other processes bound by natural links to the rest of the world. Even if an atomic mechanism suffices to mark the concatenation of everything in nature, including the mind, it cannot rob what it abstracts from of its natural weight and reality. A thread that may suffice to hold the pearls together is not the whole cause of the necklace. But this pregnancy of implication of thought in relation to its natural environment is purely empirical. Since natural connection is merely a principle of arrangement by which the contiguities of things may be described and inferred, there is no difficulty in admitting consciousness and all its works into the web and woof of nature. Each psychic episode would be heralded by its material antecedents, its transformations would be subject to mechanical laws, which would also preside over the further transition from thought into its material expression. Side note. Mechanical efficacy alien to thought's essence. This inclusion of mind in nature, however, is as far as possible from constituting the mind's function and value, or its efficacy in a moral and rational sense. To have prepared changes in matter would give no rationality to mind unless those changes in turn paved the way to some better mental existence. The worth of natural efficacy is therefore always derivative. The utility of mind would be no more precious than the utility of matter. Both borrow all their worth from the part they may play empirically in introducing those moral values which are intrinsic and self-sufficing. In so far as thought is instrumental, it is not worth having, any more than matter except for its promise. It must terminate in something truly profitable and ultimate which, being good in itself, may lend value to all that led up to it. But this ultimate good is itself consciousness, thought, rational activity, so that what instrumental mentality may have preceded might be abolished without loss. If matter suffices to sustain reason in being, or if that instrumental mentality is worth retaining, it is so only because it already contains some premonition and image of its own fulfillment. In a word, the value of thought is ideal. The material efficacy which may be attributed to it is the proper efficacy of matter, an efficacy which matter would doubtless claim if we knew enough of its secret mechanism. And when that imputed and incongruous utility was subtracted from ideas, they would appear in their proper form of expressions, realizations, ultimate fruits. Side note. Consciousness Transcendental the incongruity of making thought in its moral and logical essence an instrument in the natural world will appear from a different point of view if we shift the discussion for a moment to a transcendental level. Since the material world is an object for thought, 
and potential in relation to immediate experience, it can hardly lie in the same plane of reality with the thought to which it appears. The spectator on this side of the footlights, while surely regarded by the play as a whole, cannot expect to figure in its mechanism or to see himself strutting among the actors on the boards. He listens and is served, being at once impotent and supreme. It has been well said that only the free divine the laws, the causeless only know the cause. Conversely, what in such a transcendental sense is causeless and free will evidently not be causal or determinant, being something altogether universal and notional, without inherent determinations or specific affinities. The objects figuring in consciousness will have implications and will require causes, not so the consciousness itself. The ego, to which all things appear equally, whatever their form or history, is the ground of nothing incidental, no specific characters or order found in the world can be attributed to its efficacy. The march of experience is not determined by the mere fact that experience exists. Another experience, differently logical, might be equally real. Consciousness is not itself dynamic, for it has no body, no idiosyncrasy or particular locus to be the point of origin for definite relationships. It is merely an abstract name for the actuality of its random objects. All force, implication or direction inhere in the constitution of specific objects and live in their interplay. Logic is revealed to thought no less than nature is, and even what we call invention or fancy is generated not by thought itself, but by the chance fertility of nebulous objects floating and breeding in the primeval chaos. Where the natural order lapses, if it ever does, not mind or will or reason can possibly intervene to fill the chasm, for these are parcels and expressions of the natural order, but only nothingness and pure chance. End of chapter 9, part 2